God bless. This is Mark Anthony DeBello. Welcome to NFL Moneyball, sponsored by NFL Extended or Expert Strategic Principles, found on the web at nfl-esp.com. I am Mark Anthony DeBello, and you can find me and this program on my website, markanthonydebello.com, and just click on the tab labeled Sports. This is going to be a 30-minute program uh, divided as I have been doing into two segments. The first 15 minutes will cover uh, primarily NFL and some NCAA football from the perspective of the prophetic, the predictive, and the productive. All the systems and analytical data and research uh, done at NFLESP.com with the NFLESP system. And then the second half of the program will cover those who have a financial or an investment viewpoint or perspective and are looking for some incredibly very accurate opinion. Uh, thank God, very accurate again last week, um, and even as accurate with a lot of the um, productive and philosophical, psychological, and prophetic side of the National Football League. So, having said that, I have a lot to cover in this episode, so I'm going to go through some random notes here that I made, and then again, cover uh, the games uh, from the investment side of things. So uh, the first note I have here is on Jameis Winston. I noted how I didn't think he would make uh, as good a draft selection as Marcus Mariota next season, and I'm holding even truer to that opinion, and I think you'll see that come out to play during their careers, uh, especially in light of Jameis Winston bumping an official um, it just goes to show to his character, his mindset, um, his lack of professionalism, if you will, even though he's in college. Um, and, again, I, I think it's just a really clear-cut choice if I was a team uh, and really, really needed a quarterback that I would go with Marcus Mariota. Uh, speaking of quarterbacks, I see that somebody I've been touting all season long, Johnny Manziel, uh, got into a a fracas, I guess, um, this week or before the Atlanta game. Um, as I've noted and I saw in the game, watched a lot of the Cleveland-Atlanta game this week, I believe Cleveland would be doing even better in leading that division if they had Johnny Manziel at quarterback throughout the season. They would be much more productive. I think people are finally beginning to see that after I mentioned it in week one here in week you know, 12 or 13 that he, you know, they don't believe he should be, but I believe they and know from NFL ESP perspective, Cleveland would be much more productive with him in the starting role. And my point is that when you have somebody, that I believe, who's that talented and they're sitting the bench all season, and think of all the other rookie quarterbacks who've gotten a shot. And to me, Manziel's the best of all of them, and he's the only one sitting on the bench. So I think it's really a spiritual matter, to be honest with you. Um and, uh, you know, this is what happens when you keep, you know, and have an idle mind and uh, keep somebody, you know, that productive not playing. Um, I believe if he were playing, uh, certainly starting, um, he'd be less likely to get in trouble. It's, it's much like, you know, disrespect intent in trading an animal. You have to burn off that excess energy. Um, you have to keep their mind focused on, uh, you know, the, t the major task at hand or, uh, people begin to drift and get distracted. So, anyway, uh, some other notes here I had. I had a note on Jacksonville. Uh, I saw Jacksonville play the Rams. As I mentioned, I believe they're a lower-ranked team uh, than Oakland. Uh, they had a chance four times on the goal line um, versus um, Indianapolis this week to keep that game close, as we projected they would. Um, by 13 or 14 points. I, I know this is kind of an investment note, but um, 
again, I have a lot to say about Jacksonville, but that's just really a really a poor team, and, and they're doing a lot of things wrong from top to bottom. Uh, I mentioned, and this is part of a, something that I mentioned to um, Coach Trestman, who I consulted with again this week, um, regarding Coach Caldwell, I see that Lions have 15 points in their two consecutive games. Um, and as I said all season long, he's very conservative, kicks or attempts too many field goals, uh, and it's going to cost them some games. And I just simply made a note to Coach Trestman how from an NFL ESP perspective to try to take advantage of that in the Thanksgiving Day game uh, that they're playing in Detroit, the Bears I'm speaking of. Um, that might mean a hurry-up offense. It might mean going for some fourth downs, um, you know, fourth and shorts while Coach Caldwell is opting for field goals because as it stands now with a power rating of about a differential of about six, Chicago's going to have to manufacture six points to have a 50% chance to win that game. And that's the primary primary strategic perspective I have on that game. Um uh, knowing Coach Caldwell and having studied him for, for about a decade uh, now that he's back into head coaching. So uh, let me get into some other games here uh, from the NFL ESP perspective. And this also kind of relates to, um, you know, the investment side. But the refs this year are really, as I mentioned, home field advantage is biased, t- timely biased home field officiating calls that favor the home team. I've seen it up to seven points this year, even more so. It's really pronounced. I just saw it happen a lot in the New Orleans-Baltimore uh, game. I saw it happen a lot in the Dallas Giants game. The Giants got a lot of beneficial calls. Um, so we have a whole psychological uh, dossier, if you will, and a, a way of working with the refs to get home field advantage. In Chicago, just to mention a city, um, has less – you know, more of a business-like nature. You, you know, if you're in a city, uh, you know, like New Orleans or Denver, uh, you know, really, or Seattle, really passionate fans uh, where the refs realize that. I mean, it's amazing to me how instant replay calls even go to the home office in New York and they still uh, are incorrect. I mean, it's it's just really amazing how the home team gets such calls. Um, and, again, it's it's very gratuitous in certain cities, um, and it really also depends on the must-win situation for that team. If the refs really deep down inside know they can alter an outcome, like you know whether it's a nationally televised game or a game with playoff implications. Um, so I saw that a lot. Speaking of the Giants and, and Cowboys game, uh, that was an unbelievable catch by Beckham, Odell Beckham. Um, you'll hear a lot of people talking about it all week. Um, but again, the biggest problem with the Giants, as I noted from the beginning of this season, is the L-U-C-K, or quote-unquote luck factor, with Eli Manning is finally caught up. And even though he he had it to his benefit for the year years that they won the Super Bowl, it's you know it's a balanced out type of thing. And and for the Giants to really be um, effective again. They need to switch to at least Ryan Nassib and give him a try, if not a different quarterback. That's why, actually, you see the Giants perform so well in preseason because he's getting more reps and and more time. Um, Coach Coughlin is definitely not the problem with the Giants unless he's the one who's deciding to to go with Manning, um, which you never really know. A fan certainly never really knows. Um, uh, But anyway, so uh, having said that, um, again, fans are now finally beginning to see this, which I projected and predicted two years ago, when he, or even three maybe, when he started on his downslide. And then, as I said many, many years ago, when Aaron Rodgers was in the same situation with Brett Favre, that the Packers should, should trade Favre while he's in his quote-unquote prime, or at least have, has peaked before he really hits his downfall to get maximum value for him. And it's the same veritable situation to me I see with Ryan Nassib. Not to say Ryan Nassib's going to be the next Aaron Rodgers, but if you don't get rid of Eli Manning now, um, you know, he's only going to go, you know, have less value um, and be downgraded. So uh, that's really what the New York football giants need to do. Uh, One of the other projections I made at the beginning of the season um, and had mentioned this when the NFL 
um, wanted to rule on extending the playoffs, um, that there was going to be one division. I actually honestly thought it would be the NFC East, but I'm not surprised it's the NFC South, uh, where the team that wins the division is 500 or worse. Uh, you know, this is another reason not to dilute the playoffs. The playoffs are fine just the way they are. You don't need to add an additional wild card. Uh, just because last year you had a team like Arizona, who, again, NFL ESP projected would, uh, you know, be in the playoffs this year, um, you know, not get in last year as 10 and 6 doesn't mean you can alter the rules every year. Look at how this is balanced out, okay? Now you've got four teams vying for a division title, and none of them are, are even near 500. So, um, again, that's something else that NFL ESP can project and can help the, uh, the whole of the NFL game, um, whether it's rule changes or I'll make another note that I made a couple of years ago, three years ago, about – um, the quality of televised games, especially the ESPN Monday night games, um, and what the matchups would be in relation to the power ratings, the power spread, and you know what games w would be the most competitive and, and gain the most viewership. I know the NFL finally got wise to making division battles uh, that way, um, you know, and now their primary focus. But it doesn't mean a division ba battle upcoming like Miami and the Jets has really any significant meaning to a viewer, uh, and thus the ratings are going to go down, the earnings are going to go down. Uh, so, again, that's another byproduct and, and successful aspect of NFL ESP that we can predict, you know, who will be the biggest stars. Um, you can even think of that from a fantasy perspective. And, you know, what are going to be the best, most competitive matchups, the closest games with the most impact with regards to playoffs, you know, as the season progresses. And, as I noted, most of our season projections are spot-on accurate, including teams like Detroit and Cleveland and Arizona being in the playoffs and being near the top of their divisions, uh, you know, from the beginning of the season. And I'll also make a note uh, how I projected, or NFL ESP projected, um, I don't, Coach Tressman once advised me not to use the word I, um, so uh, NFL ESP projected, um, the beginning of the season, the strength of New England. And now um, with this battle of New England and Green Bay coming up, uh, there's a couple of more teams projected, although I must admit I didn't think Green Bay would do as well as they are. But the point I finally wanted to make on uh, that those battles or those TV games, uh, you want to get the best, you know, matchups uh, and, you know, predict what are going to be the best, you know, most competitive and and, you know, most fan-friendly games by the end of the season and even for the Sunday night football game. So, uh, again, back to the note I wanted to make on New England and Green Bay this week. I think that's the Super Bowl matchup, to be honest with you, and I'll get more into this, into the investment side. But at the beginning of the season, uh, we had projected New England against Seattle and Seattle to beat New England. Then it only took me a couple of weeks to realize uh, Seattle didn't quite have it the way they did, which I think a lot of people see. But I think you're going to see Seattle coming on now. Um, there had to be a natural lag. They're still the most talented team. Doesn't mean they can necessarily win the NFC again. I think they will, honestly. I think it's going to be between them and Green Bay and a very close battle. If the game's in Green Bay, I think you're going to see some real you know, home calls and that home field advantage I spoke about and some egregious calls in Green Bay's favor be what decides that game. But that's those are two very even teams in Seattle, um, but they won't get the better record, probably, you know, long shot that they'll get the best record. I don't know if it's still mathematically, you know, viable or not, but if that game were in Seattle, it would be a different story. I think Seattle would repeat. So as it is now, I think you're going to see the um, – and New England-Green uh, Bay game be a precursor to the Super Bowl. And I think you're going to see Green Bay win this round, this game, because of, again, as a, if you will, precursor, some home calls in their favor. Um, and, you know, New England may be a turnover here or there, uh, just one that makes the difference. But New England will come back and win that Super Bowl against Green Bay. Uh, one of the other divisions, and I'll go through the playoffs here real quick while I'm on it, um, I don't have the entire um, – we only got about, you know, a minute to go or 30 seconds before I want to get into the vest investment side of things and a little re recap from last week. But playoffs-wise, um, I think Philly will g get past Dallas this week, um, and then Philly will go on and, and win that division. Um, in the NFC North, um, 
it's coming down. Chicago, regrettably, has not followed an NFL ESP as much as they should. They're going to improve, um, but I don't think they're going to do very well against Detroit this weekend um, and will probably, you know, virtually, veritably be playoff eliminated. Um, and it's going to come down to Detroit and Green Bay. And, again, Green Bay is definitely now, I know, the better team, um, as I knew a couple of weeks ago. Detroit, too conservative. Um um, but, again, that's going to be really right down to the wire to, to see who wins that division, very much like the uh, game went last year um, against uh, Green Bay in Chicago where it was down to a final play to see who got in the playoffs. Uh, in the NFC South, uh, I think, although it is all very bad losing teams, I think you're going to see Carolina emerge. And I know I went past the 15-minute mark. That's okay. If I go to a little bit longer, I can get this whole – uh, investment side of things done in the last 10 minutes. But I think you're going to see Carolina. Um, uh, I still think they're the best team in that division. It's just because they had a really, really brutal, brutal I'm sorry, record. Um, but that tie against Cincinnati, I think that's going to be just enough to have them win that division by a half game over the likes of New Orleans and maybe Atlanta probably end up coming third. And uh, Tampa, uh, I don't think, has a chance. So, uh, And then in the NFC West, as projected from the beginning of the season, although we thought Arizona would be a wild card, it looks like they can still sustain enough to win that division, but they are weak. A very Their one-loss record is because of an easy schedule. Um, so they're going to be a little overrated, especially with Carson Palmer on the bench for the rest of the season injured. Um, Seattle will get in the playoffs as a wild card, and then again it will be Seattle and Green Bay in the finals in the NFC Conference battle. And then uh, San Francisco uh, gets eliminated as projected from the beginning of the year. Uh, moving to, the, and I'm not looking to the remaining games, which would have be helpful if I really did. Um, but I can just look in Atlanta and see they have Kansas City, Seattle, San Francisco, that Arizona. Arizona I'm sorry, that might be three losses. Um, but anyway, so having said that, um, let me get to the AFC. In the East, that's I believe the strongest division in football right now, to be honest with you, if New England is ranked, which I have them, the strong, which NFL ESP, I'm sorry, has them as the strongest ranked team and this eventual Super Bowl winner, uh, that shows also the strength of the second and third place teams, Miami and Buffalo. The Jets are obviously out of it. But just because of the, the tightness of that division and the strength, it looks like only one team will get into the playoffs. Um, and that'll be the division winner. Uh, in the AFC, I'm sorry, yeah, the AFC North, uh, again, I believe Cincinnati is overrated. Cleveland, uh, if they don't miss out by a game to Baltimore, who I projected beginning of the year, but has been gotten a lot of injuries. Uh, you know, since it, I don't think since he's going to win that division. I didn't pick him at the beginning of the year. I'm not going to pick him now. It's going to come, I think, down to Cleveland, Baltimore. Pittsburgh is a surprising team. They've done much better than I thought they would. Um, but I think their age is going to catch up with them by the end of the season, these last five games. Cleveland's definitely youthful. I, I see age beginning to catch up to Baltimore some too. So, I, I mean, I, if Cleveland gets in there, I wouldn't be surprised because, again, they're not being as productive as they could be without Johnny Manziel in that lineup. And I, I just know it. And now they've got Gordon back. And if they get Cameron, the tight end back, I mean, definitely, I told you, next year Cleveland could very well win the Super Bowl. So, um and then now to the AFC South, uh, Indianapolis, clearly the best team in that division. I thought Houston could contend for a wild card. I, I guess they're not. They're still in it. Uh, I mean, I don't have the standings exactly right in front of me, um, but I can get those pretty quick, um, and I'm going to do that right now. So uh, Houston is 5-6. and six. It's going to be really tough for them to get the wild card. Um, uh, their problems at quarterback and Clowney underperforming. Uh, you know, I projected Houston based on the fact I thought they might take Manziel. But, again, they didn't. So, that, you know, that's where they stand. Um, so, uh, again, they're all really battling tight in that AFC North. Um, in the AFC West, it uh, looks like Denver, uh, Kansas City, and San Diego are, are really scrapping for the wild card in that division. And there's um, – you know, but Denver, I think by default, is projected for the beginning of the year wins that division. Um, and we got about 30 seconds left to the 10 minute mark, and I'll get to the investments at that point. So, uh, again, in the AFC, I see New England um, playing either Indy or Denver, uh, likely Denver again in a rematch uh, for the AFC Championship, and, and definitely New England winning. I wouldn't be surprised if it's New England against Indianapolis. 
uh, Indianapolis. Indianapolis upsets Denver, um, and then it's New England beating Indianapolis um, uh, to go into the Super Bowl against uh, Green Bay or Seattle. But as it stands right now, Green Bay and then New England winning, even though Green Bay wins that game this week. All right, so... Uh, Let's get to this week from an investment standpoint in the National Football League. Uh, I'll kind of mix in last week. Last week we projected very, very well in the games. Um, Had a lot of winners if you listen to the recordings. Uh, Our top place, Seattle, won handily um, amongst, uh, you know, a bunch of others. So let me get my paperwork out here and we'll um, run down last week real fast and then I'll get to this week. Um... So last week, uh, Cleveland-Atlanta was as close as we had projected. I'm going to go on to Sunday games only here. Cleveland, uh, we liked Oakland to cover. They did. Um, Atlanta and Cleveland right down to the wire. Um, uh, Cleveland, again, most likely the better team as I projected from the beginning of the season. Not surprised they won. Philly, we projected, would go through the number, and they did. Uh, New England, we projected, would beat Detroit, and they did that, even though the public liked Detroit. Projected Minnesota would keep it close against Green Bay. We were very accurate with that. Jacksonville, we thought we'd keep it close against Indy only because everybody was playing Indy and a 14-point or 13.5 point power spread almost covered because Jacksonville, again, had a fourth and uh, four chances from the one and failed. Houston and Cincinnati, I was a little surprised by this one. Did, thought Houston would do better, but the injured quarterback, you know, you don't know how that factored into the game and when he got hurt. So, um, the Jets and Buffalo, um, uh, which was just now uh, like J- Jets to start, but once the game got moved, I knew that Buffalo would have the momentum and want to play for their city just as they did, um, not unlike Atlanta playing New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina in a small way, and, and Buffalo you know, uh, had a resounding victory there. Chicago, we projected, would cover against uh, the power spread against Tampa. They did that. Seattle was our best play. They covered against Arizona. Uh, figured that the Rams would keep it close against San Diego. They did. Almost won that game straight up. Thought Miami would keep it close to Denver. Uh, they did all game, but finally Denver uh, came through, so that was probably a loser that we picked. Um, 49ers, uh, Redskins kept it close. That's not surprising since the world was investing in the 49ers. Um, Cowboys, Giants, right about what we had figured. Cowboys to win, Giants to miraculously keep it close. And then one of our better plays was the Ravens over the Saints straight up. And I just have to mention was in a contest and would have won the whole thing. Um, a very large prize going 15-0 and 0 if that game had stayed under. Um, and even then I was going to play both totals, um, keying in on the Ravens, um, but had a technical problem, a technical glitch forced a, um, a paperwork problem, and, and that cost there. But that's just, you know... Uh, just cursed bad, uh, just a cursed bad situation. There's not much you can do there. So, uh, uh, you know, if God's not for you, He's against you. And I don't know that He was for me th- that week um, because some spirit of negativity and, and failure was certainly against me. So, nothing wrong with being 14 and one, but second place is first loser, as they say. So, uh, looking at the games this week, uh, Turkey Day. Although I'm certainly against eating God's creation in Turkey. Um, living a vegetarian diet is certainly the best way to go for any player, fan, or person. It's just the way to live. So, anyway, Detroit's playing Chicago. Um, Detroit, um, two point, two games in a row where they really underscored. I think you're going to see a lot, a lot of points in this game, and I think you're going to see Detroit go through the number regardless of the consultation that I had with the Bears. Um, I think you're going to see Detroit... Uh, cover this power spread pretty handily. Uh, the Eagles, I think, are a better team than the Cowboys, even though the game's in Dallas. Um, you got to really watch out for these home teams getting these biased home calls that I mentioned on Thanksgiving on home games. I think you're going to see that a lot. I think, you know, fortunately Dallas was able to overcome it against the Giants, and uh, Baltimore is able to overcome it against New Orleans. Uh, I think Philly then perhaps could overcome it against Dallas. Um, Seattle's playing San Francisco. Uh, Seattle, I think, is the right play here. Um, but, again, you got to watch out for the home calls for San Francisco. Um, but, again, I would go to Seattle if I had to play that game. I would definitely uh, invest in Detroit, though. Um, so going on to uh, uh, Sunday's games, 
Uh, Indianapolis playing Washington. Um, Indianapolis should go through the number, but I think Washington's going to keep it close. I wouldn't invest in that game, but if you had to, you'd want to play Washington only because uh, uh, the percentage is there. Houston's playing Tennessee. That number's a bit askew, obviously, because of the quarterback situation. It's much lower than it was for the first time that those two play, teams play, usually in a divisional matchup. You know, each team covers once. Um, but in this case, it would have to be Houston covering twice. But I think that change back to the other quarterback um, should get Houston the cover, although I wouldn't invest in that game. Cleveland's playing Buffalo, very much like the Cleveland-Atlanta game. I wouldn't send, you know, uh, all my, uh, you know, resources in on Cleveland, but I think they're the better team. But Buffalo at home, bad weather possibly. Um, again, they'll need officiating calls, and, and, you know, those officiating calls really had me uh, going this week. They've been so egregious, it's ridiculous. It's up, like I said, in some cases now over seven points in home field advantage. But Cleveland would be the play there. I think San Diego's a live play against Baltimore um, based on last week's performances for both teams in Baltimore coming off a good, hard-fought Monday night victory, though, in a scrappy, emotionally draining game. Uh, if you had to invest, you'd want to invest in San Diego here. The Giants are playing Jacksonville in, in two of the worst teams I've seen all season. Uh, if, ja- if Giants can't beat Jacksonville, they might as well just make that Eli Manning trade this week or after that game. I definitely don't see a lot of points being scored in that game. Um, excuse me for my voice either. That's going to be a very, very low-scoring game as I see it. Those are really two bad offenses. Um, Cincinnati's playing Tampa Bay. Since the third straight road game, you know a lot of people are investing in Cincinnati. I would take the points with Tampa and wouldn't be surprised if they have a straight-up upset. You know how I feel about Cincinnati all season long, that they're overrated. Uh, the Rams are a touchdown um, power spread favorite over the Raiders. Um, the Rams will probably win this game. Um, but you would have to invest in the Raiders if you invested. But, again, this is not – there's better opportunities than to invest in this game, so I would steer clear. Um, But, again, you can certainly see the Raiders covering, knowing everybody's investing in St. Louis. Um, The Steelers are playing the Saints. uh, After three straight home losses, which we actually projected, all three New Orleans home losses, I would now – Although I know Pittsburgh has a lot of home calls and is the better team, I would still invest in New Orleans this game. That's right, the underdog, New Orleans, and I think they can win that game straight up. Um, It's just, you know, that factor, as I mentioned before, of doing anything four times in a row is the odds are 15-1, to and this is a situation where we played against New Orleans three weeks in a row. Um, now we'd want to play Pitts. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Now we'd want to play New Orleans, having gone against them. Carolina is, I th- like I mentioned earlier in the program, is is a better team. You know, still power ranked pretty high, except for their you know record. But I think they're definitely a better team than Minnesota. So I would take the points there, um, even though Minnesota's at home. But they won't necessarily get the home calls because they're really out of it. Um, Atlanta is playing Arizona. This, I think, is a bit of a trap game. You know, everybody's investing in Arizona. They're definitely the better team. But, again, I, like I said, the record's a little inflated. Um, they're coming off a tough loss. Uh, not a tough loss, but a decided loss last week against Seattle. And we usually like to kind of go, you know, what I say, on and off, on one week, off the next week. If you have a team and they're live in a good spot, they usually – the roles are reversed the next – you know, the following week. And we were really against – Arizona with our best play last week, uh, so we would want to be on them this week, except, again, this is a little bit of, a, I think, a, a moto or a master of the obvious game. So in this case, I, w- I would steer clear of the game. Um, it's just a little too close to call. I, I mentioned a lot about the New England-Green Bay game. Uh, nine out of ten times I would invest in New England here. I think they're going to beat Green Bay in the Super Bowl, but, again, I think you're going to see, and this has happened before in the past when we projected it and predicted it, a reversal. Let Green Bay win this one, so to speak, and then New England will come back and win the one that really counts, which is the Super Bowl. And the totals will probably be be reversed, too. If you see a lot of scoring in this game, you'll see low scoring in the Super Bowl and vice versa. Uh, Denver's playing Kansas City on a Sunday night game. I think this game is too close to call. I think Denver should be giving more points than they are. Um, But Kansas City home is definitely going to get a lot of home cooking calls uh, on a night game, uh, on national television with a lot of playoff implications. Um, But, again, Denver's the better team. But then, again, you know, what are the refs going to do? And, you know, uh, I know – Anyway, that's all I have to say about that. And the Jets are playing the Dolphins to wrap it up on the Monday night game. Uh, Again, a poor matchup. 
Um, the world's investing in the Dolphins. If you had to have one public team win, let it be the Dolphins here, and they win by three, just like Dallas did over the Giants, but the Jets end up covering at home. So, you know, too close to call, but that's it for this week. Mark Anthony DiBello, God bless you.